Good afternoon. Welcome to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. My name is Dominic Hardy. I work in the, public, the Education and Public Programs Department. I just wanted to take a few minutes to welcome you all and to welcome Francois-Marc Gagnon uh, for the inauguration of this series. This is, I think, the fourth year in a row that we've had the pleasure of welcoming this series. And year after year, Francois-Marc Gagnon has taken us through different aspects of Canadian art history which have offered us at the museum an invaluable series of insights ever renewed, yet to be exhausted, into the meanings and the possibilities of interpretation for the co collection of Canadian art here. And we're very, very grateful to François-Marc Gagnon for having developed each of these series for, for you and for us, for all of us together, and in particular to the, to the Institute, the Galen Stephen Jaroslawski Institute, um, the Art History Department of Concordia University for offering us this series and enabling us to, to host this program. I just want to take a moment to thank, uh, as well as Dr. Gagnon, Rosemary Jolie, the administrator of the Institute, and Dr. Lauren Lerner, uh, the chair of the Art History Department, for making it possible for us to continue this very fruitful collaboration. Now, you probably all know Dr. Gagnon's writings and, uh, and his reputation in art history. I won't uh, go through an extensive reading of the things that he has done. May I just say a few words by way of introduction? That he is known worldwide for his erudition in Canadian visual culture. And uh, we constantly get uh, proof of this as we have visitors from the United States and Europe who know all about him when they come, in, when they come to us. Um, he has published on many, many topics in Canadian art uh, over 30 to 40 years career. Uh, and in topics ranging from the imagery, which derives from the initial voyages of Jacques Cartier, right through to the contemporary art, and in particular, he is well known for his writings on the Automatiste movement, Bordura, Riopelle, and others, and was the recipient of the Governor General's Award for his 1978 biography of Paul Emile Bordura. In recent years, we've had catalogs, uh, catalog exhibition texts, excuse me, I'll turn that around, exhibition catalog texts, and monographs on subjects such as Marcel Barbeau, Jacques Hurtubise, Riopel, and more recently, a major contribution to the traveling Cornelius Krughoff exhibition, which was organized and circulated by the AGO. So once again, thank you all very much. It's a great pleasure for us to be able to welcome you here. To welcome, there's a lot of people here from different sources. There's friends of the museum, visitors who are curious, alert, and looking forward to this. There are people from, uh, from the course at Concordia University with Denis Longchamp in the chair there. We're really delighted to have you all together under one roof for this experience over the next six weeks. We know you're going to enjoy yourself in the great hands of François-Marc Gagnon. Okay, good afternoon. I'm always a little bit worried when people make a presentation like that. I said, oh my God, I have to be good. And as you know, this series of lectures were given first in French. And of course, you will recognize this is my language with my accent here in English. I will do my best. Uh, sometimes you will see me going, trying to find the words without you noticing it too much, but uh, I, will, I will do my best. There's maybe two two advantage to follow it in English. Not my English, for sure. But uh, first of all, we have a more mixed audience in English. Uh, I salute uh, the uh, students of Concordia that uh, have lowered the average age of my public here. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. It's a wonderful thing. And the other thing, all the mistake I made in French, and I was told by some very knowledgeable part of this public, uh, I could correct, and I think it, uh, my text is a little bit better now than it, than it was. So there's these two advantages. Okay, this year, what I want to do is to deal with the uh, figure, the human figure, let's say, in Canadian art. Uh, we will start a little bit back in time. I said a little bit, 19, middle of 19th century. And why do that? You will see the three first lecture are basically uh, we will speak of three, I would say, almost stereotype, maybe, of uh, uh, done in, in Quebec, basically. Uh, today we will speak of religious picture, let's say, by Plamondon, or rather, Plamondon depicting uh, four nuns 
uh, of the Hôpital Général, I will explain to you what it is. And uh, I thought, okay, religion could be one of the, the main team here to, to see how they were representing, how it's kind of important value for, let's say, the, the Quebec society and also for, for Canada at the time. The second team will be uh, the habitant, let's say, the, the idea of how to represent the settler here. And I will work basically with Suzor Cote for that. The third one, of course, it's unavoidable also, is the Indian. And uh, the idea there, you will see, it's not so much the Indian as a kind of a ethnographic approach, but rather as a symbol of the fate of the disappearing nations. And as treated by Plamondon, you will see it, it was like a symbolic of the uh, French Canadian uh, fate as he saw it. Okay, so these will, will be our three first lectures. And then I will shift from time. This is, okay, middle of 19th century. And then we will deal rather with more contemporary stuff, let's say, with uh, uh, Bordeaux and Pellin. Uh, what happened with figuration in, in these two painters who are rather known for being less figurative, let's say, or non-figurative. And then uh, I want to make one lecture on Francois Sullivan, who was associated to Automatis Group. Uh, last time when I gave the lecture in French, he was in, in the hall here. And uh, it, this is also <laughs> a little bit difficult because I, I, did, I didn't want to be critical a little bit, but not too much. Of course, he, she was there. And, uh, and she was nice enough to, to stay for the whole thing <laughs> and then not to raise her hands and say, it's not that, you are completely wrong. And, uh, so, and the last one I want to speak of Michael Snow. So you see, so we will have two different periods in a way, but today we will deal more with the 19th century stuff. We'll deal with portrait and, of course, of, uh, I would say, of a society in which uh, everything is very well defined and very well fixed in terms of values, I would say, it's a religion, language, gender, all this is very well defined. Okay, people could, could make to have a certain lee of uh, freedom and liberty uh, inside of this uh, kind of frame, if you want, but nevertheless, these were values that were accepted by the whole society and not put too much in question, and especially if we deal with uh, relig religious people like the nuns that were portrayed by Plamondon that I will speak uh, today more uh, about. And the, uh, uh, so we have to start with this, with this idea that their, their view of life and the, the society in which they are doesn't give too much possibility of invention and, and liberty. You know, they were very well, well at frame. But before dealing with this, I want to present you the artist of which I will spoke uh, more today, who is called Plamondon. Uh, if you have never saw his name, it's P-L-A. M-O-N-D-O-N, Plamondon, Antoine Plamondon. And uh, also the type of, uh, uh, I would say, the type of uh, petit monde in which he tried to, to live and, and to fight also because he was a very polemi polemical uh, type of man. First of all, I, I want to show you a, a self-portrait of him when he was very old at, at the, in 1882, so it's really close to, to his death. And uh, where he seems uh, very authoritarian, uh, that was, that it was. He, he's not a sympathetic man. Uh, he was not uh, a very nice man. Uh, he was very sure of himself, very domineering also in terms of his market. I think this is important to understand. In Quebec, I mean Quebec City, he was like the religious painter par excellence, and he didn't like competition, and he was very uh, vehement, let's see, newspaper of the time to denounce this one and denounce that one. I would give you a few examples of that after. Was very proud also of his uh, education. He, he went to France, and he was always uh, bragging about being the uh, student of famous painter in France, but unfortunately they are not, so, they are not famous at all. We tried to find information on them and, and we could not even know who, who they were. So, but here you see in Quebec maybe that was good. You see, you say I'm l'étudiant of, of so and so and people, wow, this is, must be fantastic and all that. So he, he was very proud of his education, of his French education and very uh, difficult to deal with because of this kind of 
of competitive type of uh, surrounding. Not only he, he liked polemics, but you feel that he was able to create them also, just to, to attract them. You know? And he will be uh, mixed with the uh, with the Hôpital Général, I show you one slide of the uh, actual uh, building and one slide of one nuns who are not being identified but done by a photographer of uh, who, is, who is called Léon Antoine Lemire, and um, it's a man on which we don't have too much information. We just know that he was active between 1850 and 1854. So you see, it's really the same period, of course, when Plamoron was there. And it's interesting that already at the time you have photos that could be in competition with painters, uh, photographers in competition with painters. And why I show that? It is because you will see the four portraits of nuns that I want to show you one of 1832 and the three others of 1841, were portrait of nuns of this Hospital General, uh, of the Ge uh, Hospital General. The Hospital General is not uh, uh, what we will imagine today. It's not really an hospital. Uh. At the time, it was rather like an hospice, I would say, where you gathered all the beggars, the, the poor people without the homeless, uh, they had the uh, section for uh, even at a certain time for mental cases uh, for, for a long time. Let's say the, uh, uh, the, the people with mental illness will end up in this place. So they were not, it was not really like the Hotel Dieu. The Hotel Dieu was really like an hospital like we will see today. Uh, it was created already by Monseigneur de Saint-Vallier, so really at the beginning of the colony. And they had these nuns who were in charge of this uh, building. Uh, they had also the permission from Saint-Vallier at a certain time, I guess, to make some money with this because it's very nice to gather all the poor and all the homeless and all that, but it's not a way to make uh, money. And they, uh, they had the possibility to open a convent for girls, for, for, uh, for jeunes filles. Huh? And three of the nuns we will speak of were teachers, in fact. They were involved in this uh, uh, teaching aspect of the hospital general. Then it was abandoned, and finally it, it has become more uh, and a completely more uh, regular type of institution like we see uh, today. Plamono was mixed with, the, uh, let's see, his career was mixed a little bit with the Hôpital General because at the time when he will make three of these pictures in 1841, he was giving some lesson in drawing to the novice, to the, uh, the young nuns. Uh, the, we know that uh, they didn't like him much because the novice um, in question were writing a little diary, uh, if, and it's done in every convent in the world. Okay, they have to do it okay, properly with a nice language, but if you read between the lines, you will realize that he, he, he must have been a terrible teacher. They say, for instance, he teach us how to draw, but he forgot to tell us where to put the shadow. <laughs> okay, this was a big mistake. And he says, he didn't want to, to teach us miniature, Ah, that was, that's interesting because they reason the, the, that way. They said, we don't have much time in a convent. And we have so many little things to do at every half hour. We have to go to the, to the church and then we have to do this and that. Every, and their time was very, very fragmented like that. And he says he wants to teach us uh, oil painting, but this is not a good idea because first of all, it's expensive. And secondly, the time we will open the tubes and try to get settled, it will be over, we will have to go, and all this will get spoiled. And so the, at first, I thought, OK, this is a way to say we don't like him. Should we find somebody else to replace him? But in fact, in the middle of 19th century, this is very typical of, of this kind of obsession with a, f with a control of time, especially in prison. For instance, in jails, you had that. Everything would have to be very, very carefully timed. Uh, you had that also in schools. Uh, uh, the obsession there was what these young people do when we don't control them, uh, where we don't know where, where they are doing. So from six to seven, they should be there, and seven to eight, and everything was like, like this fragmented. So, and in a way, the Hôpital General was almost a prison, it was almost a, 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 it was a school, it was also a, 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 an hospital for, for a, a mentally sick people. So they had all the, the reason. It went so far that one of these doctors, not, not in Canada to my knowledge, but in France, I know a case like that, it goes so far that they were deciding that the, 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 the people will go to the toilet at the same hour. Uh, 
So how they can do that physiologically, I have no idea, but that's it. From six to, to eight, it's toilet time. We don't want to see you elsewhere. Everybody to go there. So, so this, this kind of obsession uh, with time, you had it, of course, in convent. And uh, so it was not just that he didn't like too much uh, uh, Plamondon, but also that it, it fits with their, with their idea. See, th so they resisted to this idea of learning uh, oil painting because it took too much time, it's too dispendious and all that. So at a certain time, uh, Plamondon was, was thanked for, from his service in the Hôpital General, and he was replaced by a Frenchman who was called Victor Ernet. You know? It's called like that, uh, <laughs> Ernet, E-R-N-E-T-T-E, -E -E. Victor Ernet. We know all, almost nothing about him. Uh, he was few months in Quebec uh, at the time, in 1832. He replaced Plamondon at the Hôpital General. Uh, why? Because he, he advertised that he knew how to teach miniature. So they were very happy of that. This is wonderful. This is exactly what he needs. And he was also bragging about having, having invented a new method of painting that he called painting with terium. And everybody have, that I know, uh, all my friends, uh, art historians and all that, tried to find out what it was. We have no idea. Uh, maybe it, it was a complete invention. Uh, I, we don't know what it is. The only thing John Porter of the uh, Museum of Quebec uh, told me, he says, it could be something to like uh, when you use a stencil to, to paint a pattern. See, you, you just have a kind of piece of cardboard. You cut a piece, and you remove it, and then maybe with wax or something like that. But te why terium? Terium may come from the Greek, tero, terio, that means to burn. And maybe it was a system in which, like, uh, you, you will have a, a, a piece of cloth, and then with a stencil, and then with the ironing, uh, uh, with an iron, let's say, you will transmit some heat and get a pattern like this imprinted in tissue. It's possible something of that nature. Anyway, whatever it was, the, the sisters find it fantastic, and they says, OK, goodbye, Plamondon. Vive Monsieur Ernest. And uh, they, they, they came in. And this is so typical of, of Plamondon action. When he realized that, uh, not only that, also, this Ernest says, OK, to the nuns, OK, it's expensive, uh, my lessons and all that, but you could cut your cost if you were able to send somebody to take me to your place. Because, of course, the Hôpital General was a little bit outside of Quebec proper. Huh? It was a little bit far. So if you had a, somebody with a horse who could bring me there and somebody who can bring me back in the city, I will cut my fees. So the, the nuns said, so we pray God, and of course they find right away the solution. They had two benefactors, Monsieur Pelletier and Monsieur Tourangeau. One Pelletier said, I will bring him, and Tourangeau said, I will bring him back. And so they cut it. But Pelletier and Tourangeau were two excellent clients of Plamondon. And this was too much for him. So not only he take my place, he said that, but also he, he begins to make contacts with my clients, with, with people who could buy paintings from, from me. And you will see, indeed, the painting I want to show you were, were, were financed by these two guys, uh, because uh, the nuns in question were their daughters. Uh, so, uh, so it was important for, for Plamondon not to lose this contact. So he decided to make a polemic in the newspaper of the time, declaring that this Ernet is a real charlatan. Uh, this Terium business, he says it's an invention, nobody knows what it is. And he attacked him on that. And Ernet got scared. He changed his name. Uh, he, instead of Victor, he, he became Adolphe. I don't know why. And, and he disappeared in Montreal. And then we don't hear of him anymore. So really. Uh, Plamondon was, <laughs> knew how to speak and how to, uh, how to make it uh, uh, forceful enough that uh, he will get rid of him. So I mentioned uh, Pierre Pelletier, and uh, I, I want to show you first his portrait. He's the father of one of the nuns that we will speak of. Huh? And uh, you have him and his second wife in the other uh, picture. Habitually, these two pictures are attributed to Plamondon. I would say, more, if you see in books, uh, if you see uh, John Russell Harper or, or any sources, uh, uh, except very recent one, they are both attributed to Plamondon. But we have reason to doubt this. And I will try to show you how we reason, how we uh, renew the attribution of these two paintings. 
The first thing to notice it is, of course, it's a representation of a couple, and they are slightly turned, especially the ladies, slightly turned the, toward each other. The other thing also, the two pictures have exactly the same size. Uh, and this is typical when you make a, a tondo like this, a kind of two picture of, of a couple, uh, if it's the same type of uh, uh, of a command, of an order that you get, the painter will, will respect the, the size in, in, in both cases. Uh, the, the wife, of course, is uh, defined by, his, by her costume. It's a, you, you feel that they, they are rather wealthy people. He was a merchant, uh, and he had his stores in the Basseville de Quebec, the, the lower, tone, uh, uh, lower town in Quebec, and very generous man. Uh, a little bit, uh, not in too good health, he will die from a uh, heart attack uh, relatively young. And uh, the second wife will, will of course, uh, uh, survive him. And uh, she's not the mother of the nun that I will speak later, but, of course, she, she's the wife of Pelletier. Uh, the, the, if you notice also the way the eyes and the mouth are painted, you will find that there's a kind of, uh, of uh, of a motif there that seems to be repeated, and I will show you other picture by a, a painter who, who seems to use exactly the same device all the time. See, I would say they are, instead of being real portraits in which you could say the eyes are like the door of, to the soul of the personage, they are more like mask. Huh? They, and they are defined not so much like individual, but more by their status, by what they represent. They are the bourgeoisie. Huh? They are people of Quebec who make money and ha uh, are religious people. Also, they go to church a lot. They, have to, they will have one daughter who will go to the, uh, uh, to the convent. So they, they are good people, good with the poor and everything, and also hard collectors in contact with artists. So they, they, they represent a kind of bourgeois society. Huh? The, the, uh, the, the strange thing, apparently, uh, Pelletier uh, uh, liked his portrait and the portrait of his wife and decided to ask to the same painter to make a series of portraits of his children. Uh, this is one also always attributed to Plamondo, but again, where you find the same type of little smile, uh, compare the, the smile of the boy here with the mother. And it was, it's exactly the same device, the same, and the eyes are the same also. It's as if he had a kind of systemic uh, way to, to, to do uh, faces, uh, like, rather like Matt. We don't know exactly his name. We know he's a boy from the Pelletier family. This is not surprising. At the time, the family had many, many children. Uh, it was uh, traditional in French Canada at the time to have a lot of children. The, uh, now it's exactly the opposite. But anyway, at the time, there was no problem with that. And the, so we don't know exactly who he is, but he, he seems to be part of the family. And I go on. These are two sisters. Uh, they look like dolls coming from a box. And the, uh, they are, one is called Selina. And the other is called Rosalvina. So this is wonderful names. You see that you try it with your children today, they will kill you. Huh? <laughs> they, yeah. Selina and Rosalvina Peltier, done about the same time, and probably with the same painter. Huh? You see, the more we accumulate example, the more we discover that this seems to be a kind of very good bargain for the painter, because he had the whole family to paint. You see the parents and then the children. And finally, even the baby have the same look. <laughs> huh? It's funny. It, it, it. OK, so then you have one, one piece of the argumentation. The yeah. other piece is the, follow, is the following. It is one, uh, another uh, portrait of a different uh, personage. It's called Cip, uh, Cyprien Tanguay. Okay, Cyprien Tanguay, uh, represented like a boy here, will be very famous later because he will become one of the author of a genealogical dictionary. Uh, le, le Dictionnaire de Tanguay, it's like the Bible for any, anybody interested in genealogy. This is the thing. Okay, but now he's a, he's a child. But again, you have the same little smile, the same eyes and all that, but this one is signed. This picture is signed. And it's signed by a name that, at first, we didn't know too much what it was, James Bowman, B-O-W-M-A-N. Wow. And it says, OK, so then you have, if you make the reasoning, OK, here we have a picture is a little bit like the others, but 
So you have a, what we call a st stylistic argument, huh, where there's a resemblance between a series of portraits. One is signed and dated 1832. So the temptation is to think this is all by the same author. So instead of, of attributing them to Plamodo, we attribute them now, I would say we were probably two or three who are interested by this subject, but anyway, I tell you, now we will be at least 100. And the, uh, we attribute it to, uh, uh, to James Bowman, and we date them 1832 instead of 35, like, like, uh, like we used uh, to do. Uh, who was this James Bowman? Oh, wait, I just want to make you a comparison uh, of this. This is the same boy but this time painted by Plamono. Huh? So this is interesting to put them together. The same subject, the same uh, model, if you want. It's also Cyprien Tanguay, but done by Plamono, and this one by Bowman. Huh? And then right away you see that Plamono have a kind of uh, um, talent that uh, this Bowman didn't have. Huh? I think to, to, to make it more precise, we could make a, a reflection on the construction of a portrait, of a face, if you want. You have, you could say, you have like two triangles. One in which the forehead and the two cheeks will be important, and two uh, are attached, let's say, the ears and the nose. Huh? Ear and nose are receptive organs. Uh, you, you smell with it and you hear from, from outside. So this is a kind of, of a triangle, let's see, of the face where if you stress that, if you insist on that, you will have kind of, you will express a more passive type of, of faces, if you want, something that receive. Uh. The other triangle will be created by the mouth and the eyes. I will go in that direction. And then in the contrary, these are organs that produce something. Uh. The eyes are looking outside, and the mouth, of course, speaks or, or thing. And uh, then you will have a more active face. And in fact, if you want, Plamono will be more the active one. The eyes of the little boy seems eager to look toward us. He is active, he is writing. And Bowman, in the contrary, will be the more passive type of face in which he is all reception. He, he is, his eyes look vaguely, we don't know where. He's just dreaming like his mother, like his father, like all, all the rest uh, uh, that I showed you before. And you have this little uh, smile, we don't know if he smiles or not. And the, so you have this kind of passivity. And uh, I, I guess in this case, the triangle of uh, the more passive triangle will be more stressed than, than the other. Yeah? And Plamono, in the contrary, had, had, had felt the, uh, maybe the, uh, already the, the curiosity of this uh, young boy that will become a, a, an author of a dictionary and, and will become certainly a kind of uh, a scientist, if you want. So who was this Bowman that have created the, this thing? I want, again, to, to give you a few details about him. He's an American painter, to, to start with. He's born in America in the United States, and he was a kind of wandering type of painter, meaning that you find him, it's very hard to reconstruct his biography because he was uh, for a while in Pittsburgh and then in Washington. He claimed that he was in Europe, but they all do, even if they, they never put their feet there, but they, they put that always, say, étudiant de Paris, Londres, Berlin, I always uh, the I don't know if you have this proverb in English, Abu Mantir qui vient de loin. Say. If somebody comes from far, he could lie as much as he wants, and no, nobody could check. And the, so he, uh, he, he claimed that. He claimed, he speak also that he, he was the student of Turner. I said, wow, this is fantastic. But, but Turner, of course, could be anybody in the United States called Turner. You could find thousands of them, probably. So it's certainly not the great Turner. And also the other um, astuce, if you want, or the other clever aspect of this Bowman, he succeeded before coming to Quebec in 1831 to have a letter from the bishop, from the Catholic bishop of Boston. That was a very good idea. Okay? You go in Quebec and you bring you know, have a letter from the bishop. Uh, you enter in convent. You want to, to make portrait and things like that. You want to be accepted in the right society. This was a coup de maître. Uh, uh, and indeed, he will uh, end up in the Ursuline uh, convent. Well, I show you a kind of anonymous picture uh, showing the convent, maybe it's not very convincing, but anyway, he will, he will finally end up there. 
And he will teach to the Ursuline. Apparently, they had, they had more time, more free time than the, the nuns of the Hôpital General. He will teach them oil painting. Huh? And they, they brag about it in their the journal, also in their diary. This, uh, for the first time, les personnes du sexe. Enfin, les personnes du sexe is a woman. Uh, it's a way to say the woman. Where they taught, finally, uh, the art of oil painting. Uh, so they were very happy of that. And he says he made the portrait of uh, our uh, mother superior. I will show it to you. And also, he's a good Catholic. So with that, there's no problem. He could, he could teach in the Ursuline and make the portrait of the, of the, uh, the superior and uh, in integrate like this uh, uh, his life in, in a way, he was not touching the Hôpital General. He was not with the Hôtel Dieu. He, he found another group of nuns. Uh, there's a lot of nuns in my story today. I cannot uh, escape it. But it's a fact also that these, in this society, you have so many religious orders and so many. The presence of religion is very, very strong and a little bit oppressive, of course, uh, at the same time. So he made the, the portrait of the mother superior in 1832. And watch this, uh, remind this date because the picture of Plamondon I will show you were very similar to that in terms of composition and especially the device to put the book in the hand of the sister there with her finger inside. This book, of course, is the book of the constitutions. Uh, this is the rules that the nuns are supposed to follow. And habitually, it's, uh, there was as many of these rules as, as these uh, uh, group of, of nuns uh, that you could imagine. And the church intervened, and that is, uh, that's enough you know, uh, to make uh, rules and everything. You will follow the rule of St. Augustine, and that's it. You know, everybody will follow the same rules. But they have always little, uh, uh, little notes in the bottom of the page where we really do, should do this and that and that. Anyway, so that's why it's so thick. Huh? Because habitually, the La Règle de Saint Augustin is about that thick, but it's not so, so big like this. Anyway, this is the mother superior. She was uh, an Anglophone. She was called St. Saint, Saint Harry McLaughlin, huh? but she was uh, a Catholic nun in the Ursuline. And she was a superior of the uh, of the convent. It was uh, also she was painted also by an anonymous painter, probably another nun, uh, which is very possible because this Bowman have taught uh, la peinture à l'huile. So why not uh, that they were uh, that one of the nuns will have made the portrait of the superior instead of showing her with a book. Now she's she's, she's shown in the uh, I would say in action. Uh, she's signing a document or something. She's not distracted by the little landscape outside. She's look at us or at any uh, important people that she wants to meet. So probably to correct a little bit the other image, one of the nuns, maybe one of her niece, for all we know, uh, have done this. During that time, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Plamono is at the Hotel Dieu. Uh, and I show you just a little chapel of the Hotel Dieu as it is now in Quebec. Uh, he had his, his entry there more than anything else at the time in 1830s, at the beginning of the 30s, because he works on the restoration of the so called Collection des Jardins. I don't want to enter in detail in that, but let's say there was a lot of painting bought in France after the Revolution and brought here. And, but some of them were damaged, and he painted, he, he repaired them, more or less. And, and so he was working at the time for the Hotel Dieu, for the, for the lot of, of the picture that ended up at the Hotel Dieu. Hotel Dieu was a real hospital, uh, like we, like we uh, understand it today. And uh, so he, he was working there, and, and, and you could see up to then, the career of Plamono and Beaumont were uh, separated. One was at the Ursuline, the other was at the Hotel Dieu. Each one had their little world, and they were not interfering. But then Beaumont makes a mistake for in the eyes of Plamono. First thing that he done, but I cannot show it to you, but I will try to describe what it was. He did a, a diorama. Uh, what was a diorama? It was a kind of, you, you have to imagine a big painting, habitually, in which you organize it in such a way that the spectator cannot really see the surrounding. It's big enough to occupy all his uh, attention, but also that even you will have a, l a little device or you will reduce say, the, the viewer just to a little spot that you have to put your eyes in, and then you are like literally like in the picture. 
And then habitually, if, if it was well done and well lighted, you could create the impression of real life uh, with the strong perspective lines, let's say, or, or whatever of that kind. So, uh, Monsieur Bowman decided to, decide to make a, a diorama and to invite, of course, the public to see it. Habitually, uh, the public was paying a little fees to see it. Uh, that was a way to, you don't sell a diorama, you make money with it. That's like a, it's like a, I would say, like, like a film today, in a way. So people come and look, and he says, wow, this is really fantastic and extraordinary. There was even um, a little uh, article published in the Quebec Mercury. This I can read to you, because the Mercury at the time was an English, uh, uh, newspaper, and he says, from the manner in which the perspective is treated and the light thrown on the picture, the dimension of the church and the figures are magnified as to appear of their actual size. Well, that was the effect, of course, that the diorama could, could create, you see, because you don't have any other means of comparison. You are plunged in the perspective, and for a especially if you have not seen anything more sophisticated than that, you are impressed by it. Suddenly, it, it looks real size. So the, this journalist was really impressed by that. And ocular deception is produced, the effect of which is pleasing, is as pleasing as it is wonderful. Huh? And we regard this of one of Monsieur Beaumont. So he, he didn't get his, his name right. It's a Beaumont, not Beaumont, of course. Uh, happiest efforts and recommend it to the public as an exhibition of extraordinary merit and curiosity, which derive also an additional interest from being the first painting of this kind which was being exhibited in Quebec. So who went to check that, you, you imagine? Plamondon. And he looked and he come, and the day after, he wrote terrible articles again. Bowman, that his uh, diorama is just a gadget. It's of no interest, I have nothing to do with art. And he says it's a real caricature. The les, 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 les personnages are mal dessinés. Anyway, he thought of doing exactly what he did with Ernest to try to scare the guy. But uh, indeed, at a certain point, Bowman disappeared also, but he went to Montreal. But he didn't went because Plamona was against him. He went to Montreal because he was asked to make, a, he had a fantastic contract in Montreal. The, the Notre Dame church was just built. Uh, 1832 is about the time when the two towers uh, get, get up, like you see here in this uh, watercolor of uh, John Murray. Uh, this is, by the way, La Place d'Armes, uh, without the monument of Maisonneuve. And you have to imagine that the bank of Montreal will be where we are. Uh, so this is just the, the church as it stands at the time. And there, they needed uh, paintings for many, many reasons. But the most, the, the best part of the contract was they needed the 14 stations of the cross. This is for a painter. It's fantastic. It's 14 huge painting to do for a, for a cathedral like that. So Bowman jumped on the occasion, went there. But then he didn't finish his, his contract. Well, we don't know exactly what happened. He decided to go to Toronto instead. That's a big mistake, of course, as you know. But <laughs> he, he, he wanted to go to Toronto, and he left uh, more or less unfinished his Station of the Cross. So, the, of course, the Sulpicien, the, 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 the priests there, were very pissed off with that. They wanted to, to have it. And, and you cannot imagine a Catholic church without the Station of the Cross. Huh? Why? Because in my childhood, at least, when we did terrible sin, I will not tell you which one, uh, and we go to confession, one of the punishments we were told to do it was to make the chemin de croix. Uh, we have to go like this for 14 stations. It was very long and very dull to do, but this was one of the, the, the biggest punishments. When we saw one of our colleagues, let's say, being punished like that, oh my God, what did he do? Say we tried to find out the, what was his sin. Well, I'm, I'm trying to make you <laughs> enter in this type of, uh, of mentality. The, uh, so it was a fantastic contract, but he, he didn't finish it. And then the Sulpicien decided to ask Plamono to do it instead. And Plamono was very happy, of course, because then in the competition, he was winning against Bowman. Bowman disappeared in Toronto and then probably in the United States. And he got this huge contract. And right away, he did it in earnest. You know, he created 14 stations. But he took on himself to change the traditional one. Huh? Normally, the 14th station, uh, uh, the, let's see, the, the subject matter that you're supposed to treat it was very well established by tradition since the 18th century. It's not a very old usage. 
It's in the 18th century. So uh, Jesus fall for the first time, for the second time, three times. All of them are very well defined. Plamono decided some of them were not interesting, and uh, some of them were not even based on scripture. And he decided to make eight of his own. Huh? And there were six of that on the 14 that he did that correspond more or less to the traditional one. But there was eight who were not done. When he brought that to, uh, to Montreal and wanted to install them in the, uh, the church, the Sulpician told them, it's not all right. You, you, you didn't uh, complete uh, the Le Chemin de Croix. We don't need these eight of your own. So Blamoron was, of course, <laughs> absolutely shocked. He, he, he said that you know nothing about scriptures. It was not a good idea to say to priests. You know, Normally, they know what they are speaking about. And they are ch check, of course, with Rome, if it's OK and all that. So he says, you have to complete it or not. I want to show you a little bit what it means concretely with a few examples. For instance, this one is not a traditional station of the cross. Uh, it's the cross, uh, it's Jesus with the column, uh, and habitually uh, it's not treated as such. So this is one of the contributions of Plamono that was refused by the, uh, uh, by the Sulpician. Uh, uh, for him, it was the sixth station, so he thought, uh, say he created a new order and all that, and it was, it was of course, a copy of a uh, European master. And this also was an argument of, of Plamono saying, I copy great master. You, your station of the cross are just an invention and all that. Me, I follow a uh, great model. Huh? He, he, he was certainly raised with the kind of this academic type of upbringing in which model from the Renaissance and from the 17th century were almost sacred. You see, if you repeat that, you should not have any trouble. So this is one example of a station that was refused by the Sulpicier. This is another one, the Ecce Homo. Yeah? Well, Ecce Homo is in the, script, in the scripture. He's right about that. It's really, there's a, a, a part where uh, uh, Pilatus brings the Christ in front of the crowd and he says, here's your man, you know, do, do whatever you want with him. And uh, so this was really based on scripture. But again, there's no such a thing in the traditional uh, uh, de Croix, uh, in the station of the cross. One of it that was close to, uh, to the tradition is this one. You see, sometimes Plamonon fell right. You see, like this is a good example of that. The deposition from the cross was very close to what the traditional way of cross will, will have shown. I show you in parallel a lithograph, let's see, of uh, not very good quality, but w w w you could find in many churches in Quebec at the time. It uh, represents the same scene, but of course, Plamonon did that uh, by copying uh, French masters called Jouvenet and uh, have make it much more dramatic and much more interesting in a way. But it, for the Sulpician, let's say, at least this one could be kept. Right? It says, okay. And there was two of them uh, that he never treated, and they were very popular, of course, and that Plamono decided that it's not in the scriptures, so I will not, I will not do it. Like this one, Jesus meet his mother. Uh, so of course, this was one of the important ones. Everybody wanted to, to have this one. And the other one also, the Veronica, uh, the, the lady who um, uh, wiped the face of Jesus and then get his portrait on the, on the piece of cloth. This is fantastic. And the, these two uh, stations were not treated by Plamono. And it was when, when the, the Sulpicians uh, realized that, they said, uh, you have to complete it. Uh, and so you end up with a situation where there was 14 stations, but eight were not done. And Plamono got fed up of that and, and never terminated them. And then they went elsewhere, and, and some of them were lost. And only six of them have been saved, and they are here in the Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal. Uh, uh, the others, we don't know really what happened to them. And of course, the, after Plamondon uh, failure, the Sulpicien have again to order a new artist to make the, uh, the Station of the Cross. And they find a very mediocre Italian painter who is called, uh, I forgot his name all the time, because uh, he needs, he deserves to be forgotten probably, Silvani. Silvani. Uh, and again, the, if you go now in the church, not even his pictures who are there, 
uh, it have been they have been replaced and replaced and and, and, uh, uh, and the the poor Sulpician never succeeded to to really uh, get it right uh, easily. Uh, okay, so so. What I wanted to say in this first part of the lecture is, is to give you a little bit an idea of, of the type of climate in which these painters were operating at the time. Uh, they, they, they were sponsored basically by the church. These were the big sponsor of, of French Canadian artists in particular, like Plamondon. That's why he was so eager to keep the control of this market, because if he was losing it to Bowman and Hernet and all these people who were coming in Quebec, he, he would have uh, not succeeded to make the living he, he was able to do. And in, it's in that context that at a certain point, Pelletier, in, in particular, asked him to make the portrait of his daughter, who was entering as a nun at the Hôpital General. Uh, so you see uh, that uh, finally <laughs> I fall on my feet a little bit in this. Okay, this is one of the portraits I want to speak about. Sœur Saint Alphonse. Uh, she, she was, oh, of course, given a, a specific name in religion, who is not her, her uh, maiden name, if you want. Sœur Saint Alphonse, 1841. And this uh, painting is now at the National Gallery in Ottawa. Uh, if, if ever you want to, to see the original, that's where it is. Uh, she, she was born Marie-Louise Émilie Pelletier. Uh, Marie-Louise uh, Pelletier. So she's the daughter of the merchant that I showed you in the beginning. And uh, she was born in 1816. And uh, she went to, uh, apparently, because the, the family had money, so she had a good education, certainly. She went through uh, Les Sœurs de la Congregation and then Les Ursulines, which, which was, of course, in Quebec, the, the real place for girls to, to go. It was the, the more sophisticated one. And uh, uh, they says that she was charming and uh, everything. And indeed, we have a portrait of her before she went into religion. And uh, guess done by whom? Huh? <laughs> it is by James Bowman, for sure, again. And, and the paradox, of course, here is that you have a Plamondon picture and a Bowman picture done at different time, of course, uh, maybe 1832 for, for this one, 1841 for the other. And uh, but Pelletier, of course, when he lost Bowman, decided to sponsor Plamondon instead. And Plamondon would have enjoyed this, of course, to have such. But you see, uh, before entering uh, religion, how she looks, how, how she was. You see, she was a little bit like her mother, huh? uh, with well dressed and with a lot of uh, jewels and things like that. And suddenly, she had two cousins who enter into convent, also decided to follow them and become a nun. Uh, it was done in a kind of very orderly way. You had a, a civil ceremony when you were entering in a monastery in which a notarion was there and was taking notes of, of what's happening. So we have this document. And uh, then also there was some business uh, settled. Uh, when a girl entered into a convent, the father, Peltier, uh, went to his pocket, of course, and paid 200 pounds, which was quite a, a, a substantial sum, lump of money uh, for the time, and then promised to pay 10 pounds every year for the uh, subsistence of, her, of his daughter. Uh, this was, that was a kind of economic little settlement. The day after, it was done in church, and this was the religious ceremony, a little bit like in a, in a marriage, you know, you had the, the, the uh, ceremony in front of the notarium, and then you had in the church. Uh, so that, uh, that's the way she did. So she was uh, uh, received as a, a nun. She died relatively recently uh, in 1846. So you see, she was not very old w when she died. She probably had the same type of ailment than her father. Uh, it's possible that she had a heart condition also. And she was a teaching nun, uh, for sure. You notice the gesture here, uh, that she holds the constitution also exactly like in the portrait of Bowman, uh, like I show you of the superior of the Ursuline. Uh, it's the same type of, uh, of presentation. Uh, I want to keep that here, and I want to show you a detail. You see of the, so this is really in a way to express also that her life will be defined by her rules now. See, that everything will be very codified, and there's no question to, to have too much freedom of thought and things like that. The, uh, she have also, as you can see, a kind of uh, a, a cross uh, in, in front of her. And some of them are known also. We, we have, uh, have examples of these. Uh, 
uh, where is it? I think it's here. I wanted to show. Yeah, you see, th uh, this is kind of close up of this stain, but uh, I think I have an example of. No. Ah, but no. I don't remember it. The. Uh, of the so these cross habitually were where they, they acquired them when the uh, the hunter in the convent and they were removed before putting them in their tomb. Uh, that's why when you go to Hôpital General now you have uh, maybe 100 of them to pile in a box like this. And when uh, some nuns were too poor to buy this because this was done in, in silver and was done by uh, Smith, uh, uh, silver smith, uh, they could use uh, the cross of another one uh, before them. So. Uh, the, the model that uh, The model that uh, uh, Jean was following is pro uh, go back in time. Uh, I had here an example also of a 17th century picture done by L'Argiliere. Uh, you remember maybe some of you, we had here in this museum a big L'Argiliere exhibition because M Mr. Ornstein uh, was very uh, an avid collector of L'Argiliere. So he organized, we had it maybe 10 years or 15 years ago, I don't know. Uh, uh, don't, don't lift your hand, it will give the, your age right away. So uh, the, probably uh, some, some of you may remember. So Largillier makes this portrait of a nun, and you see exactly with the same gesture also with the constitution. So it's really a kind of, uh, of a pattern that was uh, established and, and repeated uh, again and again in all this. Oh wait, this is the, uh, the little cross I wanted to put in parallel. I should have better organized my slides. You see, this is in the picture, and this is an example of these uh, silver cross that they were using. If uh, last detail I want to, to show you and to make you uh, uh, to realize it, it is, I will go back to the, the nun. It is the way she looks. Uh, she's not really looking at the painter. Uh, she avert his, his, his look. And in a way, we could understand this, uh, uh, even humanly, meaning Plamonon, as I presented it, was certainly very authoritarian and very uh, demanding from his model. So maybe she's a little bit afraid of him and she doesn't want to look at him. So there may be this kind of rapport, the fuss between both of them. But there's also a other, uh, other uh, reason who is linked more to the religious life that these girls were embracing at the time. So, because in the rules, in particular, it says that you have to be modest with your eyes. Sins come from outside. Huh? So, and ears, in the contrary, are open to the gospel and things, and should be the real sense that you open, not your eyes. So, you should avert looking too much, and that's why she's looking vaguely, a little bit on the side, both to avoid the, uh, the look or the gaze of Plamono, and also to show this kind of modesty of, of, uh, of look. Huh? The, uh, okay, so when, when we see um, uh, how it's constructed and how it, it, which kind of world he was trying to express that, then you will see that he made a series of three others of these portraits in which what I said could be applied. Of course, I will not repeat it. I will just present you a little bit who they were. So you have Another one, it was called Sir Saint Joseph huh? of 1841 also, same motif, you see with the book, and looking a little bit aside also, not directly at the painter, 1841. And this one is kept, this picture is kept at the Musée de l'Hôpital Général. So it's in Quebec, and it's not uh, in the National Gallery like the other. Huh? She is the daughter of Tourangeau, this one. You remember, I says, with, when Hernet was uh, imposing uh, f financially, uh, the, the system, he was saying, okay, if somebody can bring me to, to you, uh, to the Hôpital General, and somebody can bring me back. So Tourangeau is the second guy. So he's also a uh, very uh, wealthy man, and I think I have a portrait of him here, and I have a portrait of his wife somewhere. Yeah, this is Tourangeau and his wife, uh, both of them, uh, being like good bourgeois also, like the Pelletier were. But Tourangeau was a baker. Huh? And if you didn't know that, of course, it's not with this portrait that you will have find it out. Huh? In a way, it's interesting also this. These portraits 
are representation of status. Uh, they are not representation really of the work you do, of what you are. And it comes from the, the, the notion of dignitas, of dignity. No? The dignity is, uh, uh, to, to really give you an example of how far it went, it is, for instance, when the king of France died, there were two burials. The first one was the burial of the body, of the actual physical body of, of the king. And this was attempted by a little group of people, by the family and the noble of the court and all that. It was not too publicized. And then there was another burial where the king was, was buried publicly in effigy, like you said. That means with a kind of wax mask and with a lot of decor. And this, they were saying, now we, uh, we uh, um, put in tune the dignity of the king. So it's a different thing. And it's interesting that this is also linked to the very idea of portrait. Huh? Because you have a kind of wax model of the king with a portrait of the king that is separated from the actual body and is also giving honor because this represents the dignity of the personage. So you could say that in any portrait bourgeois of that kind, it's a little bit the same type of dichotomy. It's not so much the man that is represented there, but his dignity. It's, it's row, let's say, it's in the hierarchy of the time where he's situated. And uh, he was uh, certainly a wealthy uh, boulanger, a kind of baker, if you want. He was selling bread. This is always a good business in French milieu. You see, French uh, like bread, and so so he make money like this. And he was also very generous with the uh, painters. We know, for instance, that he sponsored Joseph Legare, and that he he gave some picture to the to the nuns also. And he had a, a daughter who entered in religion. And why not? If Peltier does it, why uh, could Tranjou cannot do it? He asked also Plamondon to make the portrait of his daughter. Huh? The the mother have. Uh, have a, an interesting name. She she have uh, she's uh, where did I put that? She she have an English name. So it's possible that uh, we, you had a kind of uh, uh, mixed marriage like this, at, at least in term of language, not in term of religion, of course, at the time. Huh? Uh, okay. So they had a daughter who entered also in convent. Another one was called Emily. And she have probably done this picture of one of the foundators of the uh, of the Hôpital General. Uh, it's a portrait of Mère Louise Soumande de Saint Augustin. So don't try to, to write it down; it's too complicated. Louise Soumande de Saint Augustin. Uh, she was a, a remarkable person, and up to now we didn't know much of her uh, in terms of pictures and things like that. But there was a, a, a fantastic discovery that was made uh, recently, I will show you, of this little picture uh, in which uh, it's her portrait also. And probably uh, Emily Tourangeau, who have made the, the picture on the left, knew it or tried to imitate it in a certain way. Or you will see or probably another one. But this is done in the country in the 17th century. The one you see on the right was done by a man called Michel Desaillant. And Desaillant was, uh, uh, could have been a fantastic painter. It's a very beautiful little uh, uh, picture, very sensitive uh, uh, from another level. I would say that the, the most of the things we find in convent today and all that. But Desaillant was not successful here. He, he didn't succeed really to have enough contract, and he, he went back to France. He was there probably 10 years. But in, at the time when this nun were or uh, still living or just being buried. Uh, that's, uh, that was a usage also that you made the portrait of nuns on their deathbed uh, because during their life, of course, they will not have tolerated this lack of humility. Uh, so, but after death, you could make as much portrait as you want. And so there they was uh, probably, uh, probably it's a kind of, and she's represented with a book, as you see, but a book with engravings and probably not, well, I would say rather a prayer book than the constitution book that we saw in the other one. Uh, uh, there's uh, another version of the same uh, nuns, also, also Mère Louise Soumain de Saint Augustin, but now without altar, and probably a res uh, rather recent picture because if you can, probably you cannot read it, but there's an inscription on the bottom right side of the picture. If you read it, the French of this inscription is very recent. 
Uh, we know that the French of 17th century have certain peculiarity, and you don't find them. For instance, she says, Age de. Uh, in old French, she will say, uh, you will write AS. Uh, you will not put a circumflex accent. You will put ASGA. AG. HG. But uh, you don't pronounce the S. The circumflex, the little. Uh, uh, hat that you put on the A now uh, is is a kind of uh, old S that I've moved above the letter. But in old French, you will have AG. And if she, uh, so the inscription is certainly modern, and we think it's done recently, maybe as a copy of the little Michel Desaillant uh, picture that I showed you before. And Tourangeau here, maybe I'm trying to imitate both of them. But I give you that also as an example of these nuns having a certain skill. Huh? I'm sure that um, uh, with the revision of uh, history of art that uh, feminist art historians are doing now, uh, they should look at these convent uh, nuns as possible hotter. Uh, some of them had talents, some of them had, uh, were also trained in the art, but they didn't sign their picture, or they, they were not uh, eager to push them in markets and things like that. But certainly, it, it deserved revision. And I'm sure that uh, we could find many career of that of painters. Like, for instance, the, the, uh, the Ursuline were bragging about the fact that they were using pictures done by the nuns in their school, in their class. Uh, probably for, uh, I don't know, showing botanic or, or uh, geography or whatever. So they were painting what they need. Like today we will use slides or we'll use uh, PowerPoint or things like that. But at the time they could make picture like that. So they, they had certainly uh, a career there that could be interesting to, to, uh, uh, to examine. Huh? Uh, I can show you two other uh, two other picture. Well, this is Sir Saint Anne, uh, another one, 15, 1841, always done by Plamondon also, and at the Museum of the Hospital General. So then it's uh, it's not in Ottawa either. And, and if you notice the difference with the other, her veil is white uh, because she's a she's not yet a full nun. Uh, she's a novice. So at the beginning, they have this white veil. And then after, when they make their perpetual uh, vows, they, they, they wear the, the black one that you saw with the others. Huh? Uh, Sir Saint Anne uh, was, uh, in the contrary of the two others, will live very long life, up to 1908. And to my amazement, she was called in one of the diary of the nuns, une relique du bon vieux temps, which is not very nice to say. You see, I, she's a relic of the good old days. And maybe they could have find another type of compliment for her. But uh, anyway, she's one of the rare ones that have lived uh, so long. She was also a daughter of Tourangeau. Uh, Tourangeau had two daughters in, at the nuns at the Hôpital General. So he had the two painted by Clamondon. And Plamono did also a picture of, his, of her brother uh, and his wife. Uh, so again, uh, the, uh, the young man and the lady are portrayed the same with the same type of, uh, uh, I would say, philosophy that I was mentioning before. And the last picture of nuns that I wanted to show you, to my opinion, is the most interesting one. Even if it's 1832, so done before the, two, uh, the three others, and I kept it for the end because there is a big difference here. Here, for the first time, you see somebody who looks at Plamondo. Yeah? So who was this nun, this one, what she was doing? The three others were teaching nuns. Uh, they were in the convent to teach. This one, no. This one, we don't know really what she was doing. Uh, so the, uh, she's, um, uh, she was not teaching. So we know that she was not among the, the nuns who, who were teaching there. She's called Sœur Saint Clair. And she's on a bench, maybe you, you can see it on the left there, and Plamondon signed there. And she is the uh, granddaughter of a very famous man who is called Francois Renvoisé. Francois Renvoisé was one of the most important silversmiths at the time in Quebec. Uh, he was uh, he's responsible for beautiful silver um, chalice or things, uh, objet pour le culte, and a uh, ve very talented man. So maybe she had this. Uh, uh, she was used to live with artists. Uh, she knew how to deal with them, and she could face Plamono. And to me, in a way, this is the, the only real 
face we have in these cities. Uh, the other are almost objectified by the look of Plamondon or by their rules that they follow so eagerly. Huh? This one was more daring a little bit and maybe younger also, more naive, I don't know. Or maybe she was dealing with a completely different part of the, of the Hospital General at the time. So she could have been responsible of uh, mental cases, of, of, of anything in fact, except teaching. And um, to conclude that, I would say, I, I will uh, maybe quote uh, uh, a, a French modern philosopher that I've reflected about what is uh, uh, a, a essentially what is ethique, uh, what is the, the kind of rapport that we have between humans. And he says ethique doesn't deal with uh, a, a definition of happiness, of a definition of the good, but it's an event. You know? And which event it is, is the encounter of a visage, of a, of a face. Uh, the moment you encounter a face, then you are in an ethical situation. Uh, and to illustrate that, uh, another uh, thinker that was quoting Le uh, Emmanuel Levinas, and I'm quoting now, uh, who is called Alain uh, Finkelkraut, quote um, a story that happened during the First World War. And the story goes a little bit like this. It is uh, an Italian soldiers that they were in trenches and in front of them there was other trenches where the Germans were. And one morning he decided to go with a friend and, and guns of course to go very quietly up to the trench of the German and try to kill the soldier uh, without being seen. Yeah. So he described that, he says I, I come closer and closer to their trench and then I see the Austrian, they were there, he says I see them. And then you realize, well, they are like us a little bit. They are drinking coffee. And it's early in the morning, and uh, they chat together. He says, I never thought that they were human beings. I, I thought the, from these trenches were coming bombs and things uh, on us. And, and he says, we had a weird idea of what, what was there. But then he says, okay, give me the gun. I'm so close, nobody has seen us. It would be a, a, a cinch. He said, at the, the spot where I was, I could kill anybody without any problem. And then suddenly, an officer, a German officer come, young man, and he comes and everybody got quiet. And he, he looks at that, he's, he's nearby and nobody see it. And then he says something tremendous happened. The uh, officer goes in his pocket and start to smoke. And he said, I wanted so much myself to smoke. So he identified himself with him, and he said, I could have, this is a big gibier, a big, a big man, he says, I could have killed him like nothing. He says, I had the finger on the trigger, and then he says, I become to rationalize my gesture, and he says, I could not do it, because in front of me, there was a man. Huh? An encounter of a visage, uh, of a face, because there's no contact, there's no language, there's no communication. It's uh, completely out of, of uh, any context. But you, I would say you have almost the concept of humanity there. Uh, it's almost just a concept, finally, that makes you hesitate to go to murder. Uh, and when we reflect on portrait, I think this is always very crucial to think of that. When do we have a face? When are we in front of a real person and not only a kind of, uh, I would say, uh, a definition or uh, somebody who is all defined by rules and by religion or by gender or by uh, language and things like that. Huh? I think to go to that core, maybe it happens once for Plamondo among these four nuns when he did the portrait of Sir Saint Clair. Okay, so thank you.